Welcome, everyone. This is Sean Shaw, and welcome to Vanguards of Democracy. Today, I have the honor of sitting down, albeit virtually, with a former Pinellas County Commissioner, a St. Pete mayoral candidate, and one of my fraternity brothers, all of whom happen to be one man, and that is former Commissioner Ken Welch. But first, I'm joined by the dynamic duo and fearless leaders of Vanguard Attorneys, not to mention my good friends, Karina Perez Illich and Sylvia Brett. They're going to make sense out of the risks and liabilities in a common enough scenario, loaning your car out to a friend or family member. Stay tuned. All right, welcome to our first segment here, liability issues when loaning your car, and we need to talk about that because it's something that is has some dangerous consequences and you wouldn't even think about it. But we're here with two awesome lawyers that I work with and I'm honored to work with them, and that's Karina Perez Illich and Sylvia Brad. How are y'all doing this morning? Uh, doing great this morning. How about uh, yourself? I'm great. I love you guys, and it's, it's great to work here, and I want to tell you, I'm going to tell the audience more about why I say that, but I want... You both, if you could give just a short introduction of kind of where you came from and why, really why you are a lawyer and how you got to Vanguard. Well, I'm a Florida native. I was actually born in Orlando. Not too many people can claim Orlando as home, but I'm one of them. I've been in Tampa for more than a decade now, so quite a while. And I became a lawyer because during college... I took a business law class, an insurance law class, go figure. Woo! And it was, I stayed awake. No. Um, <laughs> jokes aside, it was actually the first time I think I had really taken a course in school that interested me more than just passing the test. I really liked the subject matter. I wanted to learn more about it. And that spoke to me. That kind of told me, this is where I need to be going. Life isn't about passing tests. It's about taking an interest in something so that when you're in the working world, you like what you do. So I knew it was an avenue that I enjoyed, but also one that I could make a difference. So I was really excited to really find that as a student, um, being as old as I was in college, thinking that I was just going through the motions to pass courses and do well, um, but not really finding something that gave me a passion and an interest. So I was excited to find that. And that's when I made the decision to go to law school. And I can't imagine my life otherwise. That's a hell of an answer. Sylvia, your <laughs> turn. <laughs> um, so essentially, I've always kind of been drawn to law. Um, that being said, during college, I did have a stint where I thought I wanted to be a psychologist. So really? yeah, a lot so, of overlap. Yep, yeah, I know. So I so I actually ended up minoring in psychology. But at that point, I thought I was going to major in psychology, do the whole psychology thing, which love psychology, super interesting, love our psychologists. Um, and not my psychologist, but just <laughs> <laughs> psychologist, psychologists in general, great people. Um, but when you're studying psychology, a lot of what you learn is you kind of just have to just, just kind of accept everything. And I'm not the best person at just kind of like accepting everything and just kind of sitting most, there. Most and lawyers doing aren't. <laughs> right, exactly. So then I ended up going back to what I've probably should have been doing in the first place, which is law, um, where, you know, you hear of a problem and you solve it. You can't necessarily always do that in psychology. So um, how I ended up at Vanguard is actually, I, we uh, started off at an insurance defense firm. Ooh. <laughs> and um, Karina Prez Illich, who was Karina Prez at the time, was a partner there. And I would come to her for questions and we would kind of like bounce things off of each other. Um, and then one awful day, she announced that she was leaving, that she was going to go to a firm called Vanguard. I would to, call it a great day. <laughs> to be the managing attorney. It was absolutely an awful day for me at work. But then she asked me to come work with her. So um, so that's how I ended up here. And I am so, so glad that, that happened. Well, I want that's, that's what I wanted to kind of talk about a little bit more in terms of the bio is this firm is cool because it's run by women. It's run by women of diverse backgrounds. Uh, and it's run by women that are just superstars. And I think that is amazing. And it's cool. And I love that it, that happens here. And so what's it like? Because this it ain't a lot of firms like this run like this. What's it like? Is it do you have any, uh, is it any differences in how you interact with lawyers or, uh, cause you know, lawyers are kind of old fashioned. Sometimes there's always a story of the male lawyer walking in and there's a female in the room and they assume that's the court reporter and not opposing counsel. <laughs> I mean, but what's it like running this firm and being one of the rare women run firms around? 
you know, it's the the whole legal profession has definitely grown in the last at least even 10 years. Certainly you go further back from that and ask Arthenia better stories right. than I've got for sure. But I can tell you at least in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of progress with women in law, particularly here in Hillsborough County. We now have more female judges than male judges, and that helps immensely, right? It's no longer a situation where we walk in and we are the only female in the room, maybe but for the court reporter. So it's getting better um, in general outside right. of the out of these four walls. In these four walls, it's the men are the outside. Right. <laughs> I don't Sean, mind it. Sean knows all about it. Um, and it's great. We have a, a very open dynamic um, we are probably a louder and more boisterous office than, yeah, rocks. <laughs> <laughs> than, than most. You know, we chat a lot and, and our walls are thin or maybe we're just that loud. I'm not right. sure. But the communication between all of us um, is awesome. And I think that a lot of it is just it's a more uh, comfortable, open communication environment. Maybe it's Sylvia's psychology background. I don't know. <laughs> um, but I think we have a really good vibe between all of us and really – just that we make fun with the job. It's a difficult job. It's a stressful job. But all of us getting along and making the most of it, um, I think, changes our day-to-day -day immensely. I mean, I, you know, we all did defense work for a little while. And I, I just thought that was a job. And when you get to the plaintiff side, it feels much more like a calling because of the clients you're helping. You're looking people in their face. You're not looking a big corporate representative who's trying to kind of screw somebody. You're looking for someone who's had a problem. Uh who's had a crisis, who's probably come to you one of the worst times in their life. And they're coming to you, Sylvia, like you said, to solve a problem. And you're now fighting on behalf of that person. You're fighting the biggest, baddest things that are out there, which are, you know, insurance companies and, and big businesses and things like that. And that's why it's so fun to do this just because it's the, it's the David versus Goliath. Uh, and I like being David at this point. <laughs> Absolutely. I can tell you um, as a partner to a defense firm previously, um, you know, I won trials here and there and on a personal level, you feel good about it, right? You're like, I worked hard and I accomplished what I set out to do, but then you just kind of go home and you really think about what did you really win? And it wasn't until I got to Vanguard and won trials for somebody, a person who mattered that I really felt how good it means to win and help somebody and that you've really effectuated change. You've done something awesome. And it wasn't just about me being like, well, I stayed up all night and I, I nailed everything I wanted to say. I helped somebody's life and it has made all the difference in my life doing it, doing law and practicing law for people and helping people as opposed to just hoping you did your best and winning it for some insurance company who really is on to the next file. I mean, right, right. That's exactly what's going on. All right. Let's, let's talk about helping some people uh, because this is a situation that comes up pretty often and people need to think about the consequences of loaning someone your car. Don't do it. Now it doesn't happen to me because I ain't loaning it because I, I know how to say no and we're going to get to that at the bottom of how we give advice to say no, but loaning people your car. And so tell the audience some of the potential consequences that can happen when you loan your car to a friend. You know, it's it's such a common thing that sometimes people just don't think about it. You know, buddy asks you to lend the car or maybe someone's parked behind you and it's just easier to take your car and run to the store. And most people don't think much of it. And so we see this more and more in our cases. And I feel like people need to know that there are consequences of, of letting someone use your car. And it seems like such an easy decision or easy, you know, quick thought. Um, but realistically, in Florida, lending someone your car in the law is almost no different than lending somebody a gun. Think about that. We know, obviously, that guns can hurt people, kill people, in fact. That's a different topic. Uh, yeah. And we're, <laughs> we're not talking about politics today, Karina. <laughs> <laughs> and I won't go down that road, right? We only have a few minutes left. But cars are obviously just as dangerous. In mm -hmm. Florida, we have wrecks all the time, everywhere, and everyone's seen them on the road. So the law has basically said, if you lend somebody a car, it's you take on the responsibility as if you lend somebody a gun, which means if it's your car and you lend it to somebody, you're on the hook, short and simple. Um, and so people don't realize that, you know, accidents happen all the time. Most of them happen just, you know, a few minutes from your house. So when you lend somebody your car, think twice about doing it and definitely think about who you're lending it to. Does my insurance cover uh, the person that I'm lending my car to? Well, uh, 
awesome lawyer answer is it depends. Right. Well, no, that's got to be. The, <laughs> I can't give you the answer because I need to take a lot of time to write Keep a memo watching. about it. Right. Yeah. No. I, sadly, in Florida, uh, minimum insurance, the minimum required by law, would not cover it. So in Florida, unfortunately, we don't have the requirement to have bodily injury liability insurance, and that's the insurance you need if you injure or the person you let drive your car injures somebody. So if you don't have that insurance, no, you don't have insurance for that kind of that kind of situation. So you have to make sure that you purchase that type of insurance. And of course, it costs more. Right. So the minimum doesn't cover it, but it's one of the coverages I can add on when I'm talking to my agent or online or doing whatever to, to buy insurance. That And that's important to know. Does it matter if I'm in the car? Does it matter if someone is driving my car with me in it? Well, so... Um... Always, yes, but... Um, it depends. Right, right, right. <laughs> Always, it depends. Right. And um, the... So I think the kind of liability that Karina was talking about earlier is the liability for somebody else's negligence, right? Um, essentially, because they are driving your car, uh, your instrument that could injure someone, you know, you're responsible for their liability. But if you're in the car and you know that that person shouldn't be driving, then all of a sudden we get into something else, which is your own liability. Um, and so there's def definitely two different ways that you can be liable for somebody else causing damage when they're driving your car. So Karina earlier was talking about, you know, being liable for their negligence. And so now in this situation, if you're in the car and uh, Timmy's been, you know, drinking and you know it, then... Now it's your liability for your own negligence as well. But that's not the only time that it actually, that your own negligence will come up. It can come up if you know that the person, uh, if, you're, if you're not in the car and you know that the person shouldn't be driving, if you know that they have a lead foot or <laughs> if they have prior DUIs, if they have no license, um, if they love to go out and drink a little and then drive, you know, that also creates liability for you, for your own negligence. So, um, so yes, always, it depends, but <laughs> right. uh, if I'm in the car, we have been at the club like Karina was last night. Um, and I've had, I'm just going to use numbers there. I've had five drinks, mm -hmm. but the person driving has had two or three. So we're both probably past the limit, but they're in better shape than I am. And I tell them, you drive us home. That is still a problem because neither one of us should be driving, correct? Correct. <laughs> so okay. both should be Ubering. And, yeah. and I'm going to get in trouble because I, even though I'm not driving, I might not get a DUI, but if he crashes or she crashes the car, we got a big, I got a big time liability problem. Right. Definitely. Right. right. And, that's, may, and you may not have coverage for it. So you and make that's sure important. That right. You, you know, get an Uber. Like, yeah. what, are, what are we doing here? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's too easy this day. Right. It's too easy. To. Yeah. And in addition to the liability, you know, you want yourself to be safe. You want your friend to be safe. You want other people who are on the road to be safe. So it's just an, a smart thing to do. And it's also a moral thing to do. Well, See, and all Sylvia the already sounds said, like a mom. <laughs> right? I mean, all the things you've said, you know, when I'm making the decision to lend someone my car, I'm not thinking about their driving history. I'm not that like, I don't want to go through that process and make sure that I know all the things that I ought to know. And if they've got a bunch of speeding tickets and if they're like, so don't do it is the point. And it's just, don't do it. Exactly. Um, is it any different if when it's a family member or my significant other or my child even? Are you asking for domestic relations or for liability? Um, <laughs> liability. <laughs> I'm not equipped to yeah. talk about the former. As I say, we don't do divorce law here at Vanguard Attorneys, and there could be some issues there. But as far as liability, um, no, it doesn't particularly matter if it's a family member, other than the fact that if it is your own family, you might be responsible for knowing more about their driving history. So if it's your wife or your son or somebody, your, your brother, um, you might have, uh, you might know more about their driving history and whether or not they should or shouldn't be driving. But they're probably listed, at least my kids, right, are probably listed as an occasional driver of the vehicle. Well, if you do that, that would be great. Um, not right. everyone does, so make sure if you have... Because it makes your rates go up. It and sure so does. people <laughs> like to not do it. And the reason you should do it is, is if your kid's going to drive your car, you want to be protected. 
Absolutely. And there's one other situation too. A lot of parents don't realize this, but when you have a minor child, 16 years old, just getting a license, if you sign for their license and somebody has to sign for a minor to get a driver's license, by law, you are responsible for that minor child or who any minor, doesn't even have to be your child, they're driving. So whether they're in their own car or your car, if you sign for their license between the ages of 16 until they hit 18, you're also responsible for that. So that's another hook. What does another that hook. mean that well, I'm responsible for it? If you, it just means you'd be liable. So yeah. if, if that person, that minor, goes out, causes a car crash, injures some people, that means you'll be sitting next to them at the defense table in the courtroom when that case goes to trial. Oof. <laughs> mm-hmm. Talk about awkward. I don't, want, I don't want my parents sitting there at 16. Um, <laughs> is there some – so if I let's, – let's just say that I lend my car out a lot, or that's just something I do, whether it is convenience – in my life, whether it's related to what I do for a living, I don't know, but it's in the course of my life, I lend my car out a lot. What's the best way I can protect myself? Because now I'm scared. Now Kareen and Sylvia have me shook. I don't want to lend nobody my car, but I don't want to say no. Like, is there an insurance covered? What's the best way to protect myself? Look, it's spooky season. We're here to scare Ooh. you. <laughs> um, no, the best thing you can always do in any in any aspect of your life is to buy extra insurance. Make sure that you are covered in the event that something happens. And then also just, you know, do a little due diligence about who you're lending your car to. Right. And use Uber when you can. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's probably the easiest, easiest thing to do. Um, and let's get to the, the last part of this question. What's a polite, way, and I feel like this is Sylvia's question. <laughs> what's, a, <laughs> what's a polite way to say, no, you can't drive my car. Ooh. Um, well, funny story. Right. So, um, I had a professor in law school who used to say that the most dangerous car that you could possibly own is a, do you want to guess it? No, go ahead. Okay, it's a pickup truck. Yo. Because everyone is always wanting to borrow your car. So you'll have people call you up because they have a buddy and you know they, they just need to either pick up a TV, pick up a mattress, whatever it may be. So they'll give you a call and be like, hey, can I borrow your truck? So what do you do? Um, ironically, my husband owns a pickup truck. And so we find ourselves in that situation a lot. And, you know, it's a commodity that we have and we we want to be helpful to other people. So when our friends and our family ask, we actually do lend out our car. Um, but we, we're very careful about, you know, who we lend it out to. And if we think that the um, person might not be um, equipped or, you know, sometimes we just... We just offer to help because we're nice people. Um, yeah, one of the things that we'll do is we'll just be like, well, what do you need it for? I'll take you. Or, um, you know, oh, you need help with this? Okay, we'll help you out. And and most of the time, the person appreciates the lift right. or the extra set of hands. So you find yourself in a situation where you're not having to tell the person no, um, and you're also helping them out. You know, you can go grab some lunch as well. Um, but, but you know, that's that's solely for purposes of, of convenience and helping people with with carrying things. Somebody was going to ask us to drive our car and they had been drinking or for purposes of drinking. I mean, I would just say, I'm, I'm a sorry. lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, sorry. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. And like, this is why you plan. This is why you either Uber right. there, right. or if you have a designated driver, make sure that the driver doesn't drink at all. And if the worst happens and you guys have a great plan and you get to the club and everybody's drinking, you got to leave the car, right? Definitely. Like leave the car and get it tomorrow. It is not, worth it 100 it's not worth it yeah. uh well we're near the end here but we're gonna ask some cool questions because i want everybody to know how nice you all are because you just told everybody <laughs> to say no to all their friends but i want to <laughs> rehabilitate you in the eyes of the audience so they know how nice you are i want to know who inspires you i'll ask both of you that, that question kind of legal figure political figure personal figure i don't know can i go first please karina i knew <laughs> i knew it it's bonus season coming up at the end of the year. It's nice. You can get to borrow her car. Yeah. You just talked yourself into the car. Go ahead. Oh, do I need to explain why? If it's Korea, yeah, yeah. come on. I want to hear it. Okay, I have an answer to that too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, seriously, it is so great to work for her and to see her in action. Um, whenever I see her in action, my jaw like drops. And um, she is just one of the most hardworking, um, nicest people that you could possibly 
work with um, and she will, you know, she will provide great advice, but she also kind of elevates you. And so she, um, she's definitely something I, someone I admire. (laughs) All right. That's a tough answer to follow, I suppose. Um, You know, it's hard to say any one particular person that I think inspires me, but something I've learned over time in this, in this career is that there's something to be learned from everybody that you encounter. Um, I think early on in my career, when I was younger, I was very set in my ways and and focused on myself. And now as I've gotten a little bit older, I focus kind of on the other people around me. And I, and I say that because, you know, we encounter, I would say both good and bad lawyers, and there's something to be learned from both of them. Um, And not just lawyers, but even honestly, the judges, the people around, the clients, there's something to be learned from everybody we encounter in life. And I think that's kind of helped me humble my way through this process, learn for a little bit from everybody, um, and maybe become a, hopefully become a better lawyer, but definitely a better person. (laughs) Well, let me, let me ask a follow-up to that then. What does someone need to be happy? Because certainly that's an answer, at least my own experience that has changed drastically as I've gotten older. Um, What does one need to be happy? Um, It's not money. Um, Right. I'll give you that. Why the answer has changed. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the answer has definitely changed. I think to be happy, it's probably um, love and support from people around you, whether that's, you know, a spouse, a family, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, even just best friends, or as I'm so lucky, coworkers here in Vanguard. Um, I think that kind of support, someone you can talk to, um, love and, and affection, I would say, that's really what the day-to-day is all about, and that's what helps you um, you know, enjoy the good and honestly get rise out of the bad as well. So not every day is, is going to be easy or perfect, but if you have and surround yourself with the right people, um, there's always a way to, to get through it and hopefully focus on the positive more than the negative. What's our psychologist say? I know. <laughs> Pull out a copay here. Yeah. Um, I would kind of echo Karina's point, surrounding yourself with great people, um, people you can count on, rely on, you can have a good time with, but then when, you know, things aren't so good, you can go and, and count on them and have a, a bouncing board and, um, and really... Um, I think people is probably the, the key. Right. And dogs. We're dog lovers. All we of all us. Are. So. We all are. We all are. Dogs right. will help dogs when nothing are, needs to well, be said. Dogs are better than people. <laughs> um, last question. If you could eat something for a week straight, what would that be? Um, you know, at Vanguard, we eat a lot of Mexican food. We like to do Mexican Fridays. But a I'll tell you. A week straight? There's a lot of Mexican food. I, no, mean, I, tacos, I, no, I didn't burrito. ask. I didn't ask a type of food. <laughs> Ex- I like an exact food. All right, I'll so I don't go- think the answer could be Mexican. All I think right. it would have to be like tacos. <laughs> Which I probably could. But you know what? My gut instinct, uh, gut of all things, it's pizza. I'm going to go with okay, pizza. That's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. Um, so you're asking me when I'm seven and a half. I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Your, your answer is going to be expansive. Yeah. So there's a lot of things I would love to eat for a week straight. But I guess if I had to narrow it down to one, it would... Um, be maybe sushi because I haven't been able to have that in seven months. <laughs> so um hopefully come December. Pizza that'll and be sushi are very sushi different sushi answers. For a whole week. Okay. And probably <laughs> sake as well. <laughs> yes. We'll help you there. We'll help you there. Well I, w- I want to thank you all for coming on and ex- you what she says is exactly right. It's great to work at this firm. It's great to surround yourself with good people. You all are good people and I'm happy to be surrounded with you all. So I want to thank you for being on here and we'll see you next time. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. All right, welcome to the next segment. We are on here with my good friend and my fraternity brother, Ken Welch. He's no stranger to the show. He's been on before, and I wanted to have him on again because Ken is uh, in the midst of a historic run. He's going to be the first black mayor of St. Pete, and I can say it like that, and Ken will have to put all kind of disclaimers and other stuff that candidates do, but Ken is going to win. Uh, He's going to be the mayor of St. Petersburg. I couldn't be more proud of him. Ken, thank you for joining us uh, today, and you see I wore my shirt just in honor of you, brother. And I've, I've got my. <laughs> I, see, so I, I see. I represent it. I see the the Kappas and the Alphas can have their own radio show, but on this show, 
Uh, this on this show, this is how we do it. So I, I appreciate you coming on here. Ken, I, I've said this before. You are someone that I've always admi- admired from the other side of the bay because of how you approach public service. And there's some people you can just see it, and they ooze uh, a goodness for the people, a love for the job, a love for public service. You're one of those people, and, and I want to tell you that I've always thought that about you. Your long history of public service bears that out. How did you first get involved in and why? How, how and why did you first get involved in this in this crazy political stuff? Well, thank you, Representative Sean, and thank you as well for your leadership. And so, um, you know, I think we both had role models growing up. Uh, we saw folks, you know, my father was um, a city councilman. He was the first uh, African-American man elected to city council in St. Pete when I was in high school at Lakewood. And of course, like every teenager, I said, I'm never going to be like that. And uh, down the line, as I matured and grew, I saw how much of an impact you can make if you approach public service with the right goals and the right mindset. And so that, you know, my father, belonged, many other folks, Verrill Davis, Perkins Shelton, um, folks who we saw really set the path for us. Um, those are my role models. And, and that's why, you know, eventually I did move into public service. The first office I ran for was for school board. Because like you, I believe the best investment we can make is in our young people. It solves so many issues that we try to solve down the line uh, with law enforcement and social services and those kinds of things. But just public service. And I think, especially at this point in our nation, um, being authentic uh, with people and actually listening to our citizens uh, is vitally important. I think folks are tired of of the, the extreme partisan politics. They're tired of uh, politicians who just say whatever they need to say to the particular audience in front of them at the time, but never get anything accomplished. And so I think that's why we're getting the support that we're getting. And I'm excited about where we can take St. Petersburg and the the collaboration in the Bay Area. Yeah, politics these days is not fun. It's not uh, something that uh, has makes people feel good. It's and just like you said, it's easy to just throw around meat to your base it's hard to be authentic and to exhibit political courage and leadership and to do things right it's very hard these days to do politics right and you're one of the people doing it right but man it's hard because everybody is in their corners I don't care what party you are everybody is in their corners doesn't want to listen to the other side I find myself included in that sometimes I gotta catch myself and make sure that I'm listening more than just reacting and it's just tough these days it's tough. And, you know, um, you know, the whole Facebook and social media issue, they feed us what we want to hear. Right. And so you you get deeper and deeper into your silo. And as we saw, it can have life and death consequences. I mean, the insurrection was due to just false information. And still to this day, there are folks who denied that the election uh, was accurate yeah, and denied that, you know, that Joe Biden is a president. And so that's the real danger to our democracy going forward is is the undermining of truth and fact. Well, it's very, I mean, it's hard when almost half of the Republican Party believes that the election was illegitimate. I mean, it's just hard to engage in uh, true compromise and true discussions about what's best for the American people when half of one of the parties doesn't think the election was legitimate. We just got to we got to work on that. But I, I want to ask you about the mayor's race, because it's one thing, you know, you're, you're school board and then you're on the county commission for a long time. And I want to ask uh, about the county. But the mayor's thing is what's so exciting. I've never spoken to a mayor or a former mayor who didn't love the job. I, I was talking to Bob Buckhorn. He was on the podcast the other day and I was talking to him about the mayor's job. You could see the gleam in his eyes. I asked him, what was the worst day you ever had? And he said, I can't remember one. I, if I could run for mayor again today, I'd run for it. That's how much I love the job. And it's just talk to me about that. What, 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 when did you first decide to do it and, and for what reason? Well, you know, I, I never really looked at that. Uh, I served five terms on the county commission. And, you know, when Rick Baker was termed out, you know, I was approached to run for it. And I just didn't think our work was done at the county commission. Um, you know, we hadn't moved forward with, with housing, we hadn't moved forward with inclusive um, protections for sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, we actually, after the 2010 election, actually moved 
away from mainstream and, and did things like take fluoride out of the water. So, you know, I wasn't comfortable leaving a void on the county commission at that time. But elections matter. Uh, we elected Charlie Justice, uh, former colleague of yours, and Janet Long. Uh, and they really, you know, solidified the commission. Pat Gerard came on later. And we really moved forward um, and represented the, the citizens of Pinellas County in, in the way that we needed to. And we also brought in Barry Burton the last year that I was uh, commission chair in 2018. We hired a new county administrator, and he was really tuned in with with our priorities. Uh, for example, he elevated uh, Dr. Cynthia Johnson to uh, work on our small business enterprise program, and she grew that from a seventy thousand dollars going to those businesses to twenty million dollars going to small and minority businesses in just two years. And so I felt confident. And now she's the economic development director. Just got that about a month oh, ago nice. from Pinellas County. Uh, so a, another historical appointment. So I felt the county's in good hands. Renee Flowers is, is in that seat now doing an absolutely fantastic I job. I love her. So you know, nobody works like Renee. So we're in great hands. And then my fr good friend Rick Christman was term terming out. And I looked at it. I said, you know, this is the time where Tropicana Field and the gas plant, which has a history, it was, you know, a neighborhood of 800 people, churches. Our church was there, Prayer Tower. Uh, my grandfather's wood yard was there, and that entire community was displaced twice, once for the interstate, once for baseball. And now we're at the point where we're going to redevelop the tribe. And I want to be a part of that and make sure that those 35-year-old promises of jobs and economic development and equitable development come to fruition. Uh, my dad was a city councilman when that started and to, to the day he passed away, he always talked about those promises that need to be kept. Um, and also just the collaboration that I've been able to participate in as a, as a 20 year county commissioner working up with the Florida Association of Counties, uh, being elected to lead the Florida Association of Counties and working with folks uh, like Les Miller and Bob Buckhorn and, and Kathy Castor when she represented uh, part of St. Pete as a, a congressperson. Um, you know, just those relationships matter. And I think moving forward, we're going to need those kind of partnerships and relationships to move the city of St. Petersburg forward. So I thought this is the right time. I think our voice absolutely needs to be heard. And I think building that coalition uh, really paid off in the primary. There were nine people in the primary and we won by, by 11 points. And uh, we're still moving forward with um, five of the current city council members including a former uh, competitor, Darden Rice, have all endorsed me, uh, Mayor Christman, previous Mayor Foster. We just got a real strong coalition, and um, I think the timing is right for that kind of inclusive, uh, progressive leadership. No, it's clear your relationships are serving you well, and I, I focused when we first got on about you being the first black mayor of St. Pete, but you are the right person at the right time for the right seat, no matter what your color was, and, and you just happen to be black, But um, and we're all very proud of the history you're going to make, but you're the right person for the job. Uh, everyone knows that you're the next mayor and you're going to be a great one. But I want to talk about South St. Pete because uh, South St. Pete is similar to East Tampa over here. And and in what you said about promises uh, not necessarily kept and continued economic investment, and I know you all have some situations over there. You can't keep a grocery store necessarily in certain places. What are, what are you going to do to get your arms around kind of historical inequities, historical problems that have been going on for a long time, and everybody that runs for mayor talks about economic development in South St. Pete. I don't even live in St. Petersburg, and I've heard that, uh, because we hear it here in Tampa about East Tampa, and all the mayors have tried, and they all are doing things, but it's, tell me what's your plan to get your arms around turning that, uh, turning St. Pete, South St. Pete, uh, into the into a vibrant part of, um, of the city? Well, you know, I talk about this all the time, Representative Shaw. Um, if you don't stop calling me Representative, <laughs> if you don't call, start calling me <laughs> Shaw. To, 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 to honor to whom honor is Call me honor. Sean, brother. That's how you honor all me, right, please. All right, Sean. Uh, you know, I grew up in South St. Pete. Um, I attended Melrose Elementary in the last year of segregated schools. Uh, in 1970. And having grown up there, the one thing that I've seen is, like you said, politicians tend to talk about change in St. Pete, but I don't see them talking to the citizens of St. Pete in the community. 
And that absolutely has to happen. Um, when we created the South St. Petersburg CRA, which was the first community redevelopment area ever in Pinellas County's history that wasn't in a downtown, we did that by, by working with folks like Gypsy Gallardo, uh, Carl Nurse. We had forums at P-TECH with hundreds of folks there to say, look, we've got an opportunity now to change county policy, to actually have a, a ongoing revenue source for 30 years that can address poverty in one of the largest areas of growing poverty in the county. We conducted a study that showed five areas of increasing poverty at the county level, and the largest one was in South St. Pete. And that gave us the rationale to change county policy and create that. So over, over the next 25 years remaining, it's gonna produce well over $100 million that can be used for education, for job training, uh, to help folks stay in their homes for affordable housing. I want to use it in an innovative way to connect young people with opportunity. We ought to have something like what y'all are doing in Tampa, the STEM exposure program, uh, where you connect students with STEAM. You've got students uh, that are working with Mayor Castor in that program and designing tiny homes uh, with, for homeless veterans. And so that's a way to connect youth to technology and STEAM. But I want to do it in the community. You know, my opponent is talking about a science center project. It's way out west by Tyrone Mall. So again, proposing a solution that's not in the community that's supposed to be benefiting. That kind of stuff has to stop. But we are already talking to the community. We held two youth summits this summer in Absolutely. response to some of the violence that we're seeing. One was private. It was in a church, but there was no media, no streaming because of the, the whole snitch issue, right? We wanted to hear directly from kids about where the guns are coming from and, and, and what can we do as a city government to help connect them to opportunity. And the kids told us. And then working with the NAACP and Esther Eugene, we had six community forums literally in the street. We block off the street in Camel Park with law enforcement, sit in a big circle because of COVID and talk to the community. We did that in six different neighborhoods. And then we wrapped that up with a youth summit that I put on at Enoch Davis, where we brought in young entrepreneurs uh, like Trey Gillen, uh, who's my nephew, but he's also the producer for Rod Wave. Um, Lewis Murphy Jr., former mm -hmm. Buccaneer. Chris Roberts, who owns Urban Inc., uh, a tattoo uh, enterprise that employs eight people. And he's about to open his second one in Hillsborough County. And Kimberly Finch, who has an aquatics business, but she's the granddaughter of Freddie Crawford, who was one of the Courageous 12, one of the first 12 black police officers. And we show young people, here are four entrepreneurs from South, South St. Pete, who are making it, and here are your new role models. And we had that interaction and we heard from young people. We heard about things like mental health. We had young people telling us, we feel traumatized because of the poverty, because of the violence that we're seeing. And so this, the, the focus is you start by listening to the community and then applying resources to address those needs and policies to address those needs. It has to be a priority. And just as when we brought Barry Burton in to be the county administrator, he knew what the priorities were. As mayor, I'll have the opportunity to hire the new city administrator because Tanika Tomlin, uh, who's deputy mayor now, is moving on to Eckerd College. And I wish her the best. She's outstanding. She is outstanding. But we'll have, she is outstanding. But we'll have that opportunity as a new city administrator is coming in. And I'll be making that hire to say, look, this is a priority. Apply these resources and let's meet the needs in South St. Pete. Uh, in a way that that is impactful. I don't want to wait 20 years to do it. Um, part of our transition, and I've been talking to mayors as well, talked to Mayor Cantrell from New Orleans just last week about how you transition and get something productive out of it that you can implement. And so we're going to hit the ground running. I'm excited. I've served five terms. My only goal is to get impactful um, changes on the ground and move us forward as quickly as possible. No, that that's awesome. And wh while we're doing this, I want you to tell me maybe what, what are you most proud of as a county commission? What what's your what's the best part of your legacy you think as a as a longtime member of the county commission over there in Pinellas County? I think um, you know, I think it was a dream of folks like Perkins Shelton who fought for single member districts. You know, so I was the first single member district uh, county commissioner ever elected for District Seven, which is most of South, most of St. Pete and all of South St. Pete, Gulfport, Lumen, uh, Pasadena. And I think being able to build partnerships 
bipartisan partnerships. I've, I've got the support of most of our county elected officials, uh, and most of them are Republicans. I've got the support of, of five city council members, uh, five county commissioners, and it's because we focused on issues. And so we were able to make the argument, here's why we need to do the first CRA based on poverty, because we all pay from bad outcomes in education and healthcare uh, and recidivism. Being able to build those partnerships, I think, is one of the, um, I think, for folks who are just getting into politics, I think they can learn from, from how you do that and have impactful change in the community. For example, working with the sheriff, we created an APAD program, adult pre-arrest diversion. It was like civil citations in South Florida. So basically, if you have a small amount of marijuana, a, a trespass, something like that, a lot of folks get that uh, arrest and now that's on their record and they can't get a job at impacts. So working with the sheriff, we get created a program where you've got someone stationed at the jail that screens everybody that comes in. And if they're eligible for this APAD program, adult pre-arrest diversion, they never get booked. They serve community service. And then we have a really low recidivism rate. More than 5,000 people have gone through that oh, program. Wow. And dis disproportionately people of color of course. have mm -hmm. gone through that. And so that was working with the Republican sheriff and with our county commission and city council. And we got that done. That's the kind of impactful change I'm really proud of. I, and listen, I'm going to give you credit because your sheriff sometimes uh, is a problem. But I'm very proud that you were able to work with him on those things. And you're right. That's that's hard to do. It's easier to do locally. Uh, certainly, I, mean, I'm, I want to talk about Rick Kreisman some. Uh, it's, it, it's hard to do in Tallahassee, and it's even harder the further we go. And I've never seen Rick Kreisman more happy than when he left the House of Representatives and became mayor of St. Pete. And every time I see him, he's smiling and beaming, and and uh, I was dreading driving to Tallahassee to get my, my head beat in. But I, I want to talk about um, maybe some things that Mayor Kreisman is doing well, in your opinion, that you might want to continue uh, when you take over the gavel. Well, I think uh, Rick has done most things well. We go back to uh, back to the DLC days. Uh, and, and so we go way back. And I'm proud to have his endorsement, uh, particularly in terms of equity and inclusion. I think he really set the bar. Uh, make sure St. Peter is a welcoming and inclusive city. That's so important. Um, well, he's, I think he's all he and Buckhorn did very similar things and they embody the city and you can just they have rubbed off on what people think St. Peter's. So St. Peter's this welcoming, inclusive and open to all people and of all persuasions. Uh, and it's because Rick Kreisman is such a cheerleader and a champion for that. And, and you know, that's what corporations are looking for. We just brought in Arkin Investments is relocating from New York. And, and there are many other companies like that. They're looking for education. They're looking for a welcoming, inclusive uh, city and, and a safe city. I think he's also, uh, I don't think he's gotten enough credit for addressing the infrastructure issue. You know, in 2015 and 16, we had some sewage overflows. But truth be known, every city in the Bay Area had sewage overflows and both counties. But St. Pete had a real problem because we haven't been taking care of our infrastructure. You know, no no uh, mayor wants to go to a ribbon cutting for a sewer, I, right? I, I was just going to say, uh, it, so, it ain't sexy. Right, so it, it's not, but it, it's not sexy when, when it breaks. You're either. right. And you've got sewage backing up in the street and in the home. So he's put together a really strong plan called the Integrated Water Resources Master Plan. It invests more than $2 billion to fix the pipes and the plants and to upgrade our infrastructure. Uh, I definitely am going to carry that on. It's painful. It has some rate increases built into it. But I'm really hopeful that the infrastructure bill in, in Washington will be able to pull some of those dollars down to kind of offset our expenses. But I think he's in a really strong job there to try to address that issue. Let me talk about something that's personal to me, and it's the red tide that's preventing me from going fishing. Uh, Ken, I, we, listen, we need to, we got to get this under control because if I, if, I, if I can't be on the water. Talking about that real time. <laughs> and well, I'm going to talk about it again because if I can't get on this water, we're going to have a problem. But what what can you do as a mayor to kind of help with uh, the red tide issue? And now, you, you know, it's going, moving south a little bit. But, um, you know, people are, you've got, you've got a huge beach community, a very active and loud beach community. Uh, over there, what can be done from the uh, from the office of the mayor? We do. And, you know, we have to follow the science, you know, and, and the county commission, we created a 
a countywide fertilizer ordinance a few years ago, and it was precisely to keep the nitrogen load down in our waters and to clean up our waters. And so we followed the science locally. That was a countywide ordinance, but the city of St. Petersburg uh, had a similar ordinance and worked with us on it. Uh, the Piney Point issue was a problem waiting to happen. Uh, and so we need the state to have that same level of engagement with science and environmental responsibility. But we also need the state, and you've lived this, to stop preempting local governments. Yeah. Um, everything from a tree ordinance to, you know, fireworks, they want to preempt local governments. And we are actually doing the things to keep us safe and, and to protect our environment. Tallahassee is now actually able to say sea level rise, right? And able to say climate change. For a while, they couldn't even say it the took, word. It took 10 years, so, but yeah. Yeah, it took a while. So hopefully they see that it's not only about our environment, it's about our economy. They're one in the same. Bingo. You know, uh, one drop of oil from a from an oil drill, drilling rig or, you know, red tide, it impacts us across the board. So I'm hoping that uh, Tallahassee continues to try to make that turn and be real partners with local governments instead of preempting us. Let me, uh, we're, we're rolling to the end here. And as always, you're, you're yes. just very good at these questions and um, you're just so prepared and you have put in, I can't think of a better resume of someone that than yours running for uh, running for mayor Ken. And I mean that I'm not just saying that because uh, well, you. you're in front of me and you're the breast. I'm just telling you, like, <laughs> I, I can't think of a better resume, but I, I want to ask you about the race and yeah. what are, what are we going to do about the race? I, I, I'll ask you that open-ended question and let you take it. We're going to keep the race. Um, Tampa Bay is, uh, too large a market. Our TV market, I think, is number 13. We're a growing region. The only question is to me, what side of the bay will it be on? And I, as St. Pete, we're going to give it our best shot. We've got a um, a very substantial bed tax and uh, because of our beaches. Uh, and we brought in uh, another penny of bed tax when I was on the county commission, specifically to help fund a new race stadium. And so if you bond that bed tax, it's, you know, 200, $250 million uh, if we bond a full penny. So we've got that. We've got Al Lang Field, which is a site that I asked the Rays to take another look at. And again, the split season idea was rolled out awkwardly. But if you think about it, the thing that we do well uh, in Florida and in Pinellas County is spring training. And this would be like spring training on steroids. It would lower the cost of the stadium because you don't need a roof. You're talking about maybe a 20, 25,000 seat stadium. I like Al Lane because during the Grand Prix, you get that vista of St. Pete's waterfront and the stadium broadcast around the world. And our tourism folks love that. And so I went and talked to our tourism development council after the Rays rolled out this split season idea. And they really like that idea because of that. Uh, Philadelphia Phillies are in Clearwater. Uh, Dunedin Blue Jays, Toronto's in Dunedin, and they have a year round relationship. Folks buy apartments down here, condos, and the teams have minor league and rehab operations year round. And so that's what um, we bring to the table. Uh, we're both going to have an at bat and uh, we're going to swing for the fences in St. Pete. And uh, if we if we're not successful, certainly we prefer Tampa as a, as a second option. So a new stadium's got to be built regardless. Is that well, Al, Al Lang would be a major rehab. That's part of the, the feasibility uh, study that we need to do. Can't I mean, remember in 2008, the Rays wanted to go to Al Lang. They wanted that to be their new stadium. So what's really changed in that, you know, 13 years? Can it still be rehabbed or do you have to do a brand new stadium? But we think we've got the resources to be able to do that. But I always tell the Rays and the, the firms that are bidding on the TROP redevelopment that to me, the priority is the promises that were made to an entire community. It's jobs, it's economic development. And then the raises are a secondary priority because I was there when the promises were made, right? And the raise are, you know, a well-heeled organization as is Major League Baseball. So they need to come to the table with a significant investment and they understand that. And I think having that honest conversation kind of set um, the starting point, the Rays have, have supported me financially in my run to the same level that they supported Mayor Priceman. So we do have a great relationship. 
And uh, we're going to have an honest conversation and try to get this done on on this side of the bay, John. No, I hear. Listen, I, I I'm not elected, brother. I don't have a, a, a I don't have a dog in this. Other than I know you need to get the red tide fixed. That that is the issue. <laughs> we're doing we're doing everything we can on that. One. The red tide is the one that gets my attention. So we're, we're wrapping up here, Ken. I just want to ask you one final question, and yeah. it's one I like to ask politicians. I get asked it a lot. Young people, how do they get involved in politics? How, how do they, you know, they have a lot of energy, they've got a lot of want to, uh, but kind of maybe they need to be told, how do we actually do this? How do they get involved? You know, it, it's somewhat... Besides more, knocking doors for the Ken Welch campaign. <laughs> well, that goes without saying, but, you know, it's easy to get engaged, especially in this pandemic era, you know, hop on a Zoom. If you see a candidate with a Zoom meeting or or an issue that's being discussed. You know, we, we will have several forums during our transition on education, on youth issues, on housing. Jump on one of those forums and put your comment in. You know, email uh, your, your representative or your mayor or your city councilman. Find an issue that is passionate to you and make your, your voice heard. That's the most important thing that young folks can do. Kimberly Finch, for example, who I mentioned was at the Camel Park uh, discussion. I didn't know who she was, but she stood up and started talking about the, the issue of why there's no swimming access in South St. Pete. And the mayor was sitting in front. And so just by standing up and making her voice known, she made an impact and a change just by showing up and speaking out. That's what we need young folks to do. No, and everyone. To do. No, I agree. Ken, I appreciate you taking time. Uh, when is your election? November 2nd, but voting is happening right now. More than 12,000 folks have cast their ballot. So vote by mail or vote on November 2nd. You can go to KenWelsh.com for more info. And, and Brother Sean, thank you so much for the opportunity. No, of course. You're getting good at this now. You you rolled it right on out. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. And I appreciate you taking time while voting's going on. I know you're busy as a candidate. But, Ken, I appreciate you. I wish you the best of luck. And I'm going to try to be there on your victory night. And, man, I look forward to it, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Vanguard of Democracy is brought to you by Vanguard Attorneys a Florida personal injury law firm located in Ybor City that's been in practice for over 10 years. The Vanguard Attorneys team is led by myself, Senator Arthenia Joyner, Karina Perez-Illich, and Sylvia Brett. If you've been injured and want to make sure you get the best recovery possible, call Vanguard Attorneys. Naturally, you never pay a dime unless you win, but you can get that from any attorney. What makes Vanguard different is our intense commitment to getting you justice and getting it fast. If you've been in an accident, call us at Vanguard Attorneys, 813-471-4444. Call us for a free consultation. As always, you can listen live on WTMP 1150 AM in Hillsboro, 97.5 FM in Pinellas, live on WTMP, and also on AM 1150 WTMP.com on your computer, or you can download the app or the TuneIn app on your cell phone. Remember, this show is pre-recorded. It is on YouTube. Just search for Vanguards of Democracy. But because it's pre-recorded, that means I won't be able to take any questions from the studio. But don't worry. We will be in the studio very soon so that I can take questions from my listeners, and you can't wait to get there. Thank you.